What's up, everybody? Welcome into another video here on Brian Koberger's case. We have a decision from the judge as to whether or not the state is going to be able to move forward seeking the death penalty. There was a long motions hearing where the defense made all kinds of arguments against the death penalty for different reasons. We'll talk about some of those today, but ultimately, we will land on the judge's decision and whether or not we agree with it. Not whether or not we agree with the death penalty, right? That's not the question or analysis before us. But do we agree with the, with the judge's analysis and the decision he came to based on the law, based on where we are today in Idaho? So make sure you guys hit that like button. Make sure you're subscribed. Let's get into a difficult subject for many. So we're going to start here with the end of the order. And it's a 50 five page order. And it's not one of those orders that has a bunch of attachments or documents that has a bunch of attachments. This is full of case law and analysis. The judge did his job, took his time, considered all the arguments for and against each point the defense was trying to make. But at the end of the day, the motions were denied and the state will be allowed to seek the death penalty if Brian Koberger is convicted. And the defense made all sorts of arguments. We're going to highlight some of them. We're not going to go into every single one of them. We're definitely not going to read 55 pages. Um, we don't have time to do that tonight. I'm actually, as you're watching this, on a golf trip. I'm trying to unplug a little bit for the next couple of days, but stuff is still happening. So I still wanted to react. I still wanted to hang out with you guys a little bit. I'll try to be in the chat if I can. Um, but I want to record my thoughts on this because I do have a lot of thoughts when, when this type of motion comes forward. We talked about it in the Parkland case. Uh, we talked about it um, in a bunch of different scenarios as to if we're going to have the death penalty in certain jurisdictions in our country, what cases is it appropriate for? And we have to make sure we realize and understand this doesn't mean that Brian Koberger is guilty. It doesn't mean he's not guilty. That's not the question before us. That the judge did not weigh the facts or the evidence against Brian Koberger at this point to say they do prove one thing or they don't prove another. So let's remember that right off the top. And just to give some examples of some of the things that the defense argued, um, they argue that it's arbitrary for a number of different reasons. They argue um, it's geographically arbitrary, a bunch of different reasons. And these arguments have been made before. And a lot of these arguments, right, a lot of these arguments are why some jurisdictions remove the death penalty, Okay. Um, then they want to remove the individual aggravators, okay? They say it's cumulative, it's punishing twice for the same thing. They say, you know, arguing that it was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel, manifesting exceptional, exceptional depravity. And th they're saying that this is inappropriate. This is inappropriate. And we can read through some of them just to give you an idea as to what they said. They said the utter disregard aggravator applies when by the crime or circumstances surrounding its commission, the defendant exhibited utter disregard for human life. Okay. Uh, the phrase is meant to be reflective of acts or circumstances surrounding the crime, which exhibit the highest, the utmost callous disregard for human life, i.e. the cold-blooded pitiless slayer. In moving to strike the aggravator, the defendant argues that Osborne's limiting construction or judicial gloss, as he characterizes it, is unconstitutional as it violates the separation of powers. He additionally argues that Idaho criminal jury instruction, ICJ 1714, defining the utter disregard aggravator, overlaps with IJ, ICJI 1713, defining the heinous, atrocious, and cruel aggravator described in IC this one and ignores the alleged legislature's intent that the killing be done recklessly, neither argument has merit. So basically, they're trying to say that you're saying the same thing different ways. It's unfair. It's supposed to be limited. The way that you would normally read it is not really how it should be done. And this is not how we're supposed to set up things in our country. And again, the case law is very clear. These arguments really don't have merit. These are arguments that have been made tons of different ways. And again, he goes into the uh, crime being especially heinous, atrocious, and cruel. And again, this is something, these are factors that the jury will eventually determine 
is this Brian Koberger? Was that this case? So this judge rejecting these arguments by the defense is not saying that this was especially heinous, atrocious, and cruel. He's not saying it showed that Brian Koberger showed utter disregard in this situation. He's not saying it was Brian Koberger at all. He's just saying that these aggravators are not unconstitutional. They don't violate the separation of powers. And the arguments the defense made against them is not something that's going to strike the death penalty in this case. There are a couple I wanted to highlight that I found more interesting than others. These, these don't really have a lot of merit, don't take a lot of analysis, in my opinion. Um, he talks about how it's double counting because there's the multiple vic victims. Um, we don't need to talk about this one. I'm picking and choosing the ones that are most interesting to me and I think would be most interesting for our discussion. So this was interesting. So they filed a motion to trifurcate the proceedings. So we, a lot of us have heard about bifurcating the proceedings, right? The guilt phase where they prove who did it, whether or not he's guilty or not guilty, and then the death penalty phase, two phases. Well, the defense argued that it should be trifurcated. They argue it should be the guilt phase and the penalty phase should be divided into two parts. One addressing whether he's eligible for the death penalty whether there is proof of a statutory aggravator beyond a reasonable doubt, and one determining the appropriate punishment, whether it's death or life. From my perspective, I think they actually did make a few good arguments here. I think it's maybe unnecessarily cumbersome. I don't know that it's necessary to actually trifurcate it. If the judge would have allowed it, I would have been fine with that. The judge ended up doing his analysis and at the end of the day thinking he doesn't see enough benefit to trifurcating the proceedings, doing three different proceedings. So he would say they're just going to do it bifurcated like most of the country does. But I thought it was an interesting argument by the defense. Um, he ended up determining that trifurcation is not warranted. All right. So this was an interesting one. So motion to strike the death penalty on grounds of the state speedy trial, uh, preventing effective assistance of counsel. So basically the state wasted so much time. They violated Brian Koberger's right to a speedy trial. He had no choice, but to waive that right to a speedy trial. We talked about how this argument was going to be made in the future. And this is one of the ways it was made. And if you remember back in Idaho, Another case we covered, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell. This is basically the argument and the reasoning the judge struck the death penalty against Lori Vallow. Because in that case, they had a very good argument that the state violated her speedy trial rights or got close to violating her speedy trial rights. And therefore, the judge removed the death penalty as kind of a sanction against the state. Now, he didn't do it in Chad Daybell's case. I believe they made a similar type of motion, but Chad Daybell waived his right to a speedy trial in a similar way that Brian Koberger did. Almost, you know, feeling like it wasn't fair. They weren't providing a discovery enough. They didn't have an opportunity to provide their defense. Lori Vallow pushed ahead, right? And she had the competency issues and all sorts of other issues in her case, but it's kind of a similar argument. And the judge basically slams it down in Koberger's case, saying, you waived your right to a speedy trial. That was your decision. And that is not a reason that we are going to remove the death penalty in this case. Um, and a lot of the factors that he weighs are very similar analysis to what we saw in Vallo and Daybell. So contemporary standards of decency. This is where we start to get into some public policy arguments that, again, I would say fall into the bucket of you make this arg argument to the legislature and if they want to remove the, the option of the death penalty from your state, that's something that's decided by each individual state at this point. Um, and if your state allows it, then the judge's hands are tied at a certain point if he does analysis that allows the death penalty to be on the table. And he even says the death penalty remains consistent with contemporary standards of decency. All right, so this was an interesting one and one we talked about before. Motion to strike states notice on grounds of means of ex execution. So lethal injection and firing squad, basically, are the ways that they've discussed making this happen in Idaho. And the judge ultimately goes through and almost, I'm not going to say punts it, because he definitely says, I think he says that they are, he doesn't say that they're cruel and unusual, basically. But he says in order for him to really determine that, the defense has to provide an alternate method of execution, and they didn't do that. So it feels a little bit like a technicality, but he also does mention the fact that lethal injection and firing squad have been found to be constitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. So this is another instance where I believe the defense makes some very reasonable arguments, 
some very reasonable arguments that have won the day in other states and the law has changed. And I think as a, as a, you know, as the public, as a society, if certain states make the determination, and I'm just going to leave that they were denied. If certain states make the determination that they are not going to have the death penalty in their state, I can understand that reasoning. I can understand cruel and unusual. I can understand human decency. I can understand we're in a civilized society. I have personally gone back and forth on the death penalty myself multiple times for many different reasons, some legally, some personally, you know, just like how I feel and think and how I look at things, some things more objectively and, you know, how I see the law working and deterrence and punishment and what I think is best for society. I have personally gone back and forth. And I know people have a lot of strong feelings on both sides of the death penalty. But that is not a question in front of this court. This court is not making the decision as to whether or not the death penalty is constitutional, as to whether or not they're going to allow the death penalty in Idaho. Those decisions have already been made. So some of the arguments as far as is it arbitrary? Are the aggravating factors fair? Should we trifurcate the trial? Those type of arguments the judge can look at. I guess trifurcation is probably a different question, but you know, is it arbitrary? Is it decent? Is it inhumane? Is it cruel and unusual? Are the aggravators appropriate? Are they double counting? Should we allow aggravators? Those questions to me are not something the court should really make a determination on or change how the law works or how prosecutors do their case. It's the same way when people were getting prosecuted for marijuana before it was illegal. It's not a judge's job to make the decision that you can't prosecute this or that this shouldn't be illegal because of the judge's personal feelings or thoughts. So it can become very difficult. We know, right? We know there are some prosecutors and judges that are personally against this, but they cannot let those reason, those Feelings be the reason they don't enforce the law or uphold the law or analyze the law and make the decision. It can be very difficult to be put in those situations with the feelings and strongly held beliefs we may have as lawyers in these positions. So let's talk about this case and what we know and the way you have to analyze it. When you determine whether or not the death penalty is appropriate for a case, personally speaking, right? When we look at a case like this, same thing we talked about, Parkland in Florida, where I'm at, where the death penalty was sought, they had the trial, the jury ended up determining life in prison and not the death penalty. So technically the defendant won, I guess, if you look at it that way. But in this case, let's assume for our analysis that Brian Koberger is tried and convicted of these crimes. And the state proves kind of the theories that are out there that he went with a knife, did the deed to all four of these young students, leaves, cleans up, almost commits the perfect crime, okay? Goes back to living his life. I think, just in my mind personally, there is a very good argument and understanding that he showed an utter disregard for human life, that this was unusually cruel and heinous, and that it was atrocious, <clears throat> and that there are multiple victims, multiple killings, and that those aggravating factors will be able to be presented to a jury for them to make the decision, can the state prove those aggravating factors to where we give somebody the worst of the worst punishment that you can give in our society? That's kind of the analysis I'm thinking about personally in this case, right? Because we're not there. It hasn't been proven. We're not at the trial yet. And none of this will even become a question until and unless the state can prove that Brian Koberger committed this crime beyond a reasonable doubt. And you know on this channel, we're going to talk about it. We're going to hold the state to the burden. We're going to see if they proved it. We're going to see if it's shoddy police work or if they're connecting dots or if they cut corners or if they violated his constitutional rights with the IgG stuff or the search warrant, which a lot of that we don't know because it's sealed. But assuming arguendo that they prove this case against Brian Koberger, I think it is appropriate for it to be a death penalty case. I do. That's just my personal opinion. Let's say we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was video evidence of Brian Koberger committing these crimes. To me, if, you're, if you live in a jurisdiction where the death penalty is available, this is the worst of the worst kind of crime. It is horrible. It is heinous. It is atrocious. It's evil. 
The person that would do something like this is a monster. And to me, they deserve the worst of the worst ultimate punishment if they are convicted of this crime. And again, doesn't mean I love the death penalty or I want the death penalty in every state. Again, I've told you personally, I've gone back and forth. You know, I'm very big into redemption. I hope for redemption. I pray for redemption. I hope even the worst of the worst of the people can be redeemed and can turn their life around, even if they're in prison for the rest of their life. I realize that's unusual and not something that always happens. And some people could say impossible or is too, too much of an optimistic look on life because that's not how it works. And I understand that we may view things differently and see things a little bit differently. And I, I think that's why I, I want to see the best in things like the Menendez brothers, where maybe they can be rehabilitated and do good things in prison and then come out and be contributing mem members of society. And the death penalty removes that option, especially for somebody young, like the Menendez brothers or like Brian Koberger. He's still young. He's got a lot of life ahead of him. So that's where I'm constantly torn. But legally speaking, if your state has the death penalty, I think it is possible they prove these aggravators and that this case would fall in the bucket appropriate for a death penalty case. That's just, that's just the way I see it. This is not really an opinion channel, right? I don't usually give my opinion a lot. I like to just kind of explain both sides of things and ask questions and learn. Um, but I thought it was a question a lot of people had and a lot, a lot of people are going to be talking about. And I want to know what you guys think respectfully as you can in the comments. Um, if you see it this way, if you don't, um, but I'm interested, I'm interested to hear, and I'm, I'm always interested in which cases get the death penalty and which ones don't for different reasons. People asking why not Jose Ibarra, why this case, why Chad Daybell, why not Lori Vallow? And again, that's kind of can be a technicality that we dug into comparing those two cases. And again, an argument made in this case that the judge denied a similar argument. Hey, you're basically violating the defendant's rights. So what's the remedy? Well, you remove the death penalty from the table. Doesn't mean it wasn't heinous. Doesn't mean it wasn't atrocious and cruel. So I don't know. This is a, this is a somber one. You know, it's, it's another somber one in a line of just really brutal, sad cases. When we think of the victims and we remember the victims and what happened to them. And if Brian Koberger is the guy that did that, that's heinous, atrocious, and cruel. So those are my thoughts. Let me know what you guys think. Um, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any <coughs> other videos on this topic. We'll continue to follow this case as you guys continue to ask and send it to me and ask questions on uh, X and on Instagram and on YouTube. But that's all we got for this one. Till next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.